Hello world, and we are back. My name's Kyle Fischel. This is going to be the next episode of my poker vlog. It has been a little bit since my last video and even my last poker session. I honestly have not been playing too much in the last few weeks. I was enjoying my 4th of July and I also thought it'd be good to take a week or two off as it's my personal opinion that if you're going to play poker for the purpose of winning money, I find myself making more bad decisions with emotion as my justification rather than, you know, thinking logically through situations. With that being said, I have an announcement coming up. So Saturday, August 1st, my dad is going to be in town. Flashback. This is dear old dad. I'm Gary Fischel. End of flashback. And we are going to spend our day playing poker at Orange City. We're going to have a 1-3 game going. It is a sh extremely informal meetup game, if you will. He he's not what you would call a good poker player. So if you're usually a 1-2 player at Orange City or you're in the area... That would be the game where it is most advantageous to take your shot at slightly a bigger game. But it's going to be fun, and I hope to see a bunch of people there. I have three hands of note from the last two sessions that I played that I think were quite interesting and could even have a small bit of educational value. First, interesting hand. With one limp to me, I am in middle position with pocket sixes. This is definitely well within my limping range. I personally choose to construct a limping range with most pocket pairs, all ace X suited, and a lot of suited connectors. It lets me balance and uh, navigate a lot of boards post-flop as I have quite a wide range, all of which can play relatively well multi-way. So pocket sixes is gonna be a limp. There's one other limp before the button who is a true recreational player, raises to $20. With this raise size, I'm not quite sure what he's looking for. If he wanted folds, he would have to go quite a bit bigger. The size didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at the time, but either way, first limper calls, easy call for me, and the last limper calls as well. So we're going four ways to a flop, which comes eight, five, deuce, two hearts. The first limper checks and it's on to me. Normally I would check to the pre-flop aggressor, but this board is unlikely to connect with a pre-flop aggressor. And with that being said, I would only have to get through the limper to my left to actually win this hand. So I actually consider to leading out, I think a donk lead for pot, like exactly $80, would win most of the time. However, this recreational player has C bet with a 100% frequency anytime it's checked to him. Like over seven to eight hands, anytime it was checked to him and he was last to act, he would bet quite large. So with that being said, I think a premeditated check raise is very much the most optimal play in this spot. So I check, third limper checks, the pre-flop aggressor bets $50. First limper folds, already planning a check raise, I raise it to $130. Thinking I'm gonna get a fold a lot of the time, all of his air pretty much just has to fold and I win. And I think sometimes even an eight with no kicker could theoretically let it go. Other limper folds and the preflop aggressor calls. This is very much not what I wanted to see. I'm prepared to check most turns, maybe reevaluate based on how the texture develops. Well, the turn is a seven. Now this is a card where I am not going to check it back as I just gained eight outs if for some reason he had an eight or a random over pair. This is a pivotal decision moment. I believe nines, tens, jacks, any over pair to that board would have just clicked it back, got all in on the flop. So I don't really think he has an over pair when he just called. I think a random eight is possible. And additionally, I want to charge him in case he has just two overs of hearts, like king, queen of hearts. So definitely a card where I'm going to continue with. I do something I normally don't do. I bet over half my stack. I bet $225, leaving me about $150 behind. I figured the over half size bet likely will get me more credit than just a full-on jam. I feel like a jam looks more bluffy and makes it easier to call with just a pair of eights, which is what I'm really just targeting to fold because anything else that calls I'm likely ahead of. So I bet 225, he thinks for a long time, and I don't really see call as an option for him 
To me, it's either jam or fold. I'm definitely gonna call it off if he jams, especially with how long he's been thinking. But as played, he chooses to just call. I hope I river a nine. The river is another seven. Quite an interesting run out. Quite a safe run out, really. The board texture shouldn't have changed too much. I definitely think that this board texture favors my hand and my range much more than him. Theoretically, I could have six, seven here, who check raises a bluff with open-ended, turned a pair, and then actually river trips. I think that makes a lot of sense for my hand. And because I'm gonna call a jam anyway, I think open jamming gives me a chance of getting him to fold. If he just called three streets with an eight, like he held on and I threw everything I could at him to get him to go away from it, but. Th thinking I can get this player to, to throw away his hand, I decide to go all in. Oh, 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 Which was exactly $158. He needed a count and he thought about it. Like he thought about it for at least a minute and a half, then two minutes. Like he was thinking for a long time. He eventually calls. Okay, you're good. I just flip my cards over, tell him he's good. And he goes to flip his cards over and stops and looks to see what I have. And I'm like, he just kind of shakes his head and says, no, you're good. Oh, shit. No, oh, my shoulder. Awesome. I'm guessing he called with ace king because I don't really know what else he would play this way specifically. The reason I tell this hand is I think it has a good educational point to explain. So for instance, if you're going to call someone down with ace high and he actually is bluffing with an under pair to the board, like I was, you know, make no mistake, I'm bluffing with this hand. Like it, it's not for value. He had a correct read. It just so happened that that sometimes the bluffing range is actually still strong enough to beat some hero calls. So it's important to think if your opponent's gonna turn weak pairs or even weak two pairs on super dynamic boards into bluffs because it's possible. So next interesting hand with zero limpers to me, I am in middle position with pocket queens and I make it $20. It folds all the way to the button who raises to $75. Now this button player is actually a quite a competent reg who I've played a lot with. He really doesn't three bet a whole lot. I don't really have an established four betting range. You know, with that being said, I think aces kings would call me here. Even if I four bet, I think ace king could comfortably fold. So really no reason to four bet here. So I just call. The flop is six three deuce rainbow. I check it to the pre-flop three better who bets $160. He over bet the pot by just a little bit. Okay, now let's think about what hands he would do this with. I really don't think a premium like aces or kings would over bet the pot or even bet pot with this. I think that a strong premium over pair such as that would bet closer to half or one third pot. I believe that's closer to what GTO says. Comment below if I'm right on that one. Because you're really not worried about many hands that would call a three bet. Because theoretically, if I had like eight, nine, I would just fold it. I, I whiffed. If I had a hand like pocket sevens, pocket eights, I might fold that as well. You know, just not a great hand. And if I had a hand like ace king, ace queen, ace x, that'd probably fold too. So when you're betting so big, you're getting so many strong hands to fold. So when he makes it that big, it makes me feel like he wants a fold. So I can see him doing this exact line with sevens, eights, nines, tens, and then some ace X. With that being said, he only has about $200 behind. So I think this is a pretty standard jam. Got a safe board. I'm pretty happy to go in with queens here. And he has pocket kings. You want to punch me right now, but you won't. You want to punch me too, Brennan? You guys both look like you might want to hit me in the face. You do. I can tell. Well, why don't you do it? So, I mean, maybe he was going for just super protection against random ace x's maybe he just thought i was strong enough to call him off the lesson with this hand is really that just because you would play a hand a certain way and think that it should be played a certain way doesn't mean your opponent is unless you can competently tell what level of thinking your opponent's on comparing it to your own level of thinking 
probably isn't gonna help you all of the time. Now, granted, you could say this hand is just a cooler and it's gonna happen no matter what, but I don't know, there, there's some people I would just make that fold to. I'll be rethinking this one for a bit of time. Comment what you would have done. So a final hand of note. I didn't get to play a lot these last few weeks because I was actually working in Tampa at some odd hours. So it limited my playing and vlogging ability. I did play two sessions where the first one, I, I built up a pretty good stack and then got it all in pre with pocket kings against pocket sixes. So you already know what the turn was if you know how well I run with kings, but I'm all in pre-flop. So with that session, I made $87. Came back a few days later and had one really interesting spot. So an early position player makes it $15. There's one caller. I'm on the button with pocket queens. Definitely not going to call. Definitely going to size up a bit. I make it $65. And only the pre-flop aggressor, who actually recognized me, even though I was wearing a mask from my vlog. So shout out to that guy. He is the only caller. So we're heads up to a flop, which comes three eights. Kind of a strange board. Don't see too many of those. When he checks to me, I think this is a board that I should see bet 100% of my range. What are you doing? I'm burying you. <laughs> if I'm on a three bet with ace king, this is a board where I have to bet again because I could be well ahead of all of his random connectors with that hand specifically. And with my literal hand of pocket queens, I think every smaller pair is just going to call off and be well behind. So I bet $75. He thinks for a bit and then calls. The turn is the six of clubs. So kind of a dynamic card, but then I have to rethink the board texture. So a straight or a flush doesn't change anything. And if you had pocket sixes, that's still pretty much dead. So theoretically, I should have the nuts here since he did not four bet me pre. So I think this is a very safe card to just barrel away and Barrel again on the river, barring an ace or a king coming. So I bet $125. This is your fault. Oh, I'm exhausted. I want to sleep good tonight. And the opponent calls again. Okay, please just a card lower than eight. Well, the river is a 10. And my opponent checks to me. I think about checking it back. Honestly, I do. I think pocket tens makes a little bit of sense here. But I, I decide I really have to go for some value here. Like checking back fifth nut is just way too weak, honestly. So I bet $225 and my opponent raises to $700. Don't you touch my drum! Hmm. 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 Quite an interesting board. Quite a polarizing bet. So let's reconstruct this. He raised 15 and then called a three bet. How many eight nines, eight sevens, ace eights could he have there? Probably not a whole lot. Now, could he have a hand like ace 10 of clubs that had two overs to the board and then turned a flush draw and continued and then made what he thinks is the best full house? I think that's possible. I think with the same logic, like 9, 10 of clubs, where you turn a gut shot straight and flush draw, even though it's kind of a strange board for that. So not too likely that's it, but I think it's possible. And additionally, I think he could miss value uh, 9, 7. So I think there's some value hands that he would play the same way that I'm actually beating. His bluffs are definitely possible, as earlier on in this session, the opponent bet... $300 into me on a four heart board where I happen to have the king of hearts. So easy call, you know, he bluffed with air. So he's willing to put up some big bluffs on quite dicey boards with absolute air. So this opponent has some bluffs. He has some value hands that I beat. It's possible he has pocket tens, but I beat so much. I don't think he ever has aces or kings. I think this one's a call. Well, with all that being said, I call and he does in fact have pocket tens. Guess I just had that one coming. Not the river card I was hoping for. Not by a long shot. Quite unhappy to see that one. I left that session down $934. Kind of disappointing, but it is what it is. If you like the video, please consider subscribing. It would help me out a ton. I would greatly appreciate it. And remember, if you're in the area Saturday, August 1st, there's going to be quite a fun table going at Orange City. So comment if you want to be on it. There will be more to come next week.